Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the James Julia Auction House. I'm looking at some of the guns that they're selling in their upcoming October of 2015 auction. I found these three revolvers, and they're all very closely connected to each other in a really, actually really interesting story. So I figured we'd take a look at all three of these together, because there's a lot more to learn from them together than there is independently. Now these are all Confederate War revolvers. This is an area of firearms collecting that has, it can be tricky to get into. Uh, these guns are very old at this point, and they have been, people have been making fake Confederate revolvers since like 1865 uh, for a very long time. And it's actually gotten to the point where there are fake ones out there that have been out there for so long that they actually have an authentic aged patina to them even though they were manufactured new after the war. So it's really tricky to find and properly authenticate Confederate revolvers. So having access to these three here at the auction, which are definitely authentic real revolvers, is a fantastic opportunity to take a look at this story. Now these are Leach and Rigdon and Rigdon and Ansley revolvers. Now you of course, uh, Rigdon is the common name between those two. What happened was at the beginning of the war, or actually before the war, Thomas Rigdon was a uh, scale maker, mechanical tinkerer, made things. Uh, and then Thomas Leach was a cotton trader. So the two of them set up a partnership. They actually made swords at first, but by May of 1862, they decided to uh, set their factory in Columbus, Mississippi to making handguns. They made about 75 and used them to garner themselves a contract with the Confederate government to make 1,500 revolvers. Now these first revolvers were, actually all of these, were basically copies of the Colt 1851 Navy. They're 36 caliber, and that's a recurring theme in Confederate handguns. There wasn't a whole lot of industry down in the Confederate South, and there wasn't a whole lot of firearms development going on down there, uh, with a few notable exceptions, but in general there wasn't. And why reinvent the wheel when the Colt company has designed a fantastic gun and all of a sudden, you know, the CSA is its own new company, new country, and it really doesn't have to worry about patent infringement lawsuits from the North. So, you know, why take the time? Let's just copy the best thing that's already out there. And that's what most Confederate revolvers are. Now, these guns associated with Leach and Rigdon and Rigdon and Ansley are quite well-made guns. They're high quality, uh, good good materials as best as could be had in the South at the time. And they went through this interesting progression. So they made a, uh, Leach and Rigdon together made about a thousand of their 1500 gun contract. So production went pretty well. Um, the guns came out good. They were, they were well made. They were used extensively. They were issued throughout the Confederacy. And by the time they'd made about a thousand of them, unfortunately for them, Union forces were starting to encroach on the factory and they needed to move to make sure that the factory didn't get overrun and captured. So they moved to Greensboro, Georgia in December of 1862, and then shortly thereafter, uh, in the spring of 1863, they moved again to Augusta, Georgia, and that's where the factory would remain for the rest of the war. Now by the time they got to Augusta, they'd made about a thousand of their 1500 gun contract, and at that point Thomas Leach left the partnership and they, the company dissolved as a formal entity. Uh, no one apparently really knows why he left. Could have been any number of things, frankly. Um, however, at that point, Rigdon uh, acquired all of the assets of the company, all the tooling, the machines, and he found a couple new partners, most primarily a guy named Jesse Ansley, and they basically just continued to produce what the Leach and Rigdon guns had been. Um, had all the same tools, all the same jigs, the same contract. They finished out that 1500 gun contract for the CSA, and then they started working on more guns. And as the firm of Rigdon, Ansley, and company, they would make about another 900 to 1,000 guns. So total production of this, well, from this set of tooling through this series of companies was about 2,400. Now a couple interesting things. When the company becomes Rigdon, Ansley, and company, they actually adopted a new and additional patent. They, the Manhattan Firearms Company in 1859 had patented this idea of instead of putting six cylinder stops, they put in 12 and the additional ones would act as safety notches. So you could actually lock the cylinder, hammer down, right in between two chambers. And that was actually a really cool safety addition because all of a sudden now you can very effectively carry the gun fully loaded, six shots, without having to worry that a, a 
jar to the hammer would discharge a cartridge or a, a cap. Now, Colts had a safety mechanism. They had little pins on the back of the cylinder in between the nipples, and it worked, but they were fragile. It wasn't, it, was a, it worked, but it wasn't a great solution. And, and this 12 cylinder stop idea was a much better solution. Well, it was patented by the Manhattan Firearms Company, so Colt didn't use it. Charles Rigdon is down in the CSA, and he really doesn't care what Northern courts are going to say. So he went ahead and just started using that patent right alongside the Colt patents that he was infringing upon. Uh, and so the, the, la the last 900 or so, the, the last set of Rigdon and Ansley guns, all have this 12-cylinder stop uh, built into them. So here we have all three of the guns lined up from earliest, middle, and latest. Now the, the distinctions between these guns are really pretty subtle, and there's only one significant one that you can really see in this kind of perspective, and that is the change from having six-cylinder stops to having 12 on the latter two. Now, when we start looking at it a little more closely, we'll see some more changes. So, let's begin with the earliest gun here. Notice that there is no cap removal cutout right up here. That was done basically just to simplify production of the very first batch of guns. What Colt had was actually a cutout right up there. And that allows better removal of fired caps. So you fire this chamber, and then it rotates down to here. When it does that, you've got this spent remnant of a cap that has to come off the nipple. It, if it doesn't, you do run the risk of it jamming the cylinder when it starts to rotate down around at the bottom. So the very early Leech and Rigdon guns did not have that. Now, the really early ones also had a slightly different style of uh, loading lever retainer which this gun, this is number 1063, so this isn't from the very beginning. This is actually fairly late in the first production run. Uh, Marking-wise, let's take a look at that. The markings are one of the essential details here. This is marked Leach and Rigdon CSA, and it's only marked on one of these barrel flats, so that's typical. There are some very early ones that actually have a marking from Leach and Rigdon's very earliest company, which was actually the Leach and Rigdon Novelty Works, humorously enough. Um, those guns are extremely rare. Now these will be marked with serial numbers on virtually all of their parts. Something interesting to take a look at, notice the, uh, the digit one in this serial number, because what's kind of funny is they only had one set of serial number punches. And as they were making guns, parts started to wear, and around serial number 1200, the number one stamp broke. So when we look at it, let's take a look at this one. This is number 1500 and change. You can see that that digit one is now kind of just a, a blob. Doesn't really look like anything. See the comparison? We have 1000 where the stamp was in good shape, about 1200 in between it breaks. And then down here, we have number 1500, where it's uh, a broken stamp. So some of the very first batch of Leech and Rigdon guns will have safety pins on the back of the cylinder, where you could rest the hammer in between chambers. This particular one does not. Some do, some don't. Two other things we can take note of. Most of these guns will have an inspection stamp here or down here. This one has an N. There are four different letters that it can be, um, and there doesn't seem to be a good explanation for what those letters stand for, but you will typically see that down there. Now, also of interest, this particular gun has an SC stamp in it, which is actually a known thing. That's South Carolina. Guns in about the 950 to 1200 serial number range went to South Carolina forces. This is, of course, number 1063, and it actually has some documented provenance back to a South Carolina officer. That's pretty cool to see on a gun like this. So, our second gun, this is serial number almost 1600, 1580, so. Uh, so this is the second major style of marking. Uh, they had obviously moved to Augusta by the time they were marking them this way, and they left off the company name at this point. They just went with the location and the CSA, the Confederate States of America stamp. Now this one also has an inspection mark. In this case, it's a W, and it's down here on the back of the frame, but still legit. 
And again, serial numbers in pretty much all of the parts. Up here, we actually have a serial number on the front of the loading lever. And the major, major functional difference, we now have 12 cylinder stops. So you can see I have the hammer rested on a, a cap there. I can pull it back, rotate it to right there, and lock the cylinder in place in between two, two nipples. So then it would be safe to carry, safer even to carry than the, the original Colt style. Now our third, and this is probably the most unusual and valuable of this trio. This is a very late gun. This is serial number 2182 and is one of only three that are known to exist where they have a lot more information. This is actually stamped C.H. Rigdon, C.S.A. Augusta, Georgia on three of the barrel flats. That's a really unusual, uh, there are just a couple of guns known to do that and they're all right in this exact serial number area. Now I had mentioned that that, stamp, that number one stamp had broken around serial number 1200. Well around 1900 something else must have broken because they got rid of the whole set of dies and they went to a new set of larger numbers. So if we compare the early one to this later one you can see that the serial numbers have gotten larger. They went to a new set of stamps. So now our, our numeral one is intact again. We still, however, have serial numbers on all, pretty much all the parts. This one isn't numbered up here. Uh, now the, the general mechanical pattern of this guy has stayed the same from you know, serial number 15, 1600 out to the end. We have 12 stops. We have the cylinder, the uh, cap removal cutout right there. This has a Colt style loading lever right there. So very interesting to be able to look at three of these guns side by side and see some of the differences and some of the similarities. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Now if you'd like to have any of them or all of them for yourself, well of course they are for sale. This is an auction house. If you take a look at the description text below here, you'll find links to the catalog pages on, on Julia's auction site for all three of these and you can check out their formal descriptions and their high-res pictures and everything else you need to make a decision. You can place bids online or you can come down here and participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.